Thank you, Paula. Thank you so much. Thank you. And is the recorder on now? It's all on. Thank you. Hi, Tika. Hi, Tika. Heitka, Heitka, Siam, Siaya. As Co Salish Matriarch and Elder, I wish to give warm thanks to all my relatives here on Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations for welcoming me to live in the unceded and ancestral lands of my relatives of the Musqueam and Richmond for close to 40 years now. As Co Salish Matriarch and Elder, I wish to give each and every you, one of you warm welcome, who may be studying, who may be teaching, living, working, playing, or even visiting our, on our traditional, unceded, ancestral, and occupied lands of our Musqueam, our Squamish, and our Tsleil-Waututh. Ceremony. Ceremony guided each and every step of each and every day of our lives has taught to me by my elders. I have in my hand these cedar boughs, as taught to me by my elders. We would pick those cedar boughs each and every morning. We would go into that cold, cold water. What we are doing is ceremony. We are brushing every single part of our bodies off with those cedar boughs. What we are doing is a cleansing. We are pushing all the negative and evil energy off of us so we could go about our day in a good, and respectful way. Just starting my 33rd year of going into classrooms in the Lower Mainland, talking about First Nations, I'm presently in five school districts in the Lower Mainland. I'll share the exercise with each and every one of you today that I share with those little ones right from preschool right up into university to share the meaning of negative energy. And I'll ask you each to participate with me. Raise your hand, folks, if you've ever felt a cranky moment in your life. <laughs> Feel free to raise, too. <laughs> that, my dear friends, is the meaning of negative energy. Can you do things really well when you are cranky? Uh-uh. Maybe extra hard, maybe extra fast, but not really well. So brushing all that negative energy off of you in that cold, cold water each morning so you can go about your day in a good and respectful way. Part of the power of the sacred cedar boughs when you use them in ceremony puts a protective force around you that will constantly deflect that negative energy off of you as you go about your day. Other important ceremony is taught to me by my elders is the ceremony of introduction to share your name, your nation, your family. And if it isn't your traditional territory, to always respectfully ask permission to be on that territory. I'll share that with you now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Roberta Price. My heritage is I am Coast Salish. I am Snanima on my dad's side, and that's where I was born. When they came to our lands, they couldn't say our names. They couldn't say our language. So perhaps when they couldn't say Snanimo, they called it Nanaimo. So I was born there right on the number one reserve, right on the waterfront in Nanaimo. And I am Cowichan on my mom's side. The dialect of the language of my people is taught to me by my elders on this side of the water. The language of my people is called the Halkamilam language. I knew and understood and spoke my language fluently until I was six years old. Beyond six years old, I was not allowed to have anything to do with my language, my heritage, and my culture. And I was actually tortured about that. I have spent well over 40 years reclaiming back my identity searching out for my family, and especially searching for my mother. Very, very pleased and proud to finally find my mom 
when I became a grandmom in 1994. I was able to spend eight years with my mother before she passed away. My mother affirming all the teachings of all the elders I work with on my journey of looking for my mom. Felt those elders were stepping stones to meeting my mom. And I share, as my mom would tell me, yeah, that's the way we do that cultural teaching. Yeah, that's the way we do that ceremony. And I share with you that due to those horrific experiences from age six onwards, for many, many, many years, I used the contemporary Western method of healing, counseling in psychiatry and psychology. But I really felt the greatest part of my healing journey came. I call this dear friend today a friend. She was my boss in the early 80s. She's now with my granddaughter in the car who will not wake up. <laughs> my dear friend Flo, she was my boss. My dear friend Flo spent her entire life in the residential school. My dear friend Flo was also helper to the elders. She knew what I needed. She brought me to those elders. Those elders, they took me under their wing. They taught me. They guided me. They prayed for me. But mostly importantly of all, what those elders did for me is they loved me. They loved me unconditionally. Unconditionally. Because when you are ripped away from your family, age three, four, five, six, and older, what you are missing is that unconditional love you receive from your parents, your grandparents, your family, your nation, your community. That unconditional love, they give it to me lovingly. They gave it to me openly. Never ever did I dream for one moment at that time that close to 40 years later, I would be walking in those elders' footsteps today, sharing that same unconditional love with so many and so many communities. We still need it. We still need it very, very much. I hold my hands up to those elders. I give thanks in my prayers every morning when I wake, every night before I sleep. Very, very grateful to those elders. I want to share with you, though those elders, I had the blessing and the grace to work with close to 30 elders in my journey. As I go in to the hospitals, I'm at BC Women and Children's giving service to 1,975 families in the last seven years. I'm with Vancouver Coastal Health, the Aboriginal Patient Navigator Program in the rest of the hospitals and at St. Paul's through Providence, given service to over 800 families in that journey in the past seven to eight years. I go into all the mental wellness wards. I share a little bit of my story to lift their emotion, to lift their spirit, sometimes get a smile or a chuckle out of them. When I say, share with them, hey, Elder Roberta, pretty hard nut to crack. Close to 30 elders never gave up on me, never, ever once. Just like I'm not going to give up on you. So I hold my hands up to all of those elders from all the different nations. I want to share with you, getting to that elder stage in your life, I know things, I see things. And those elders, they knew who I was. But I had to find out who I am. Very, very proud to share with you today. In the year 2018, I know who I am. And I hold my hands up high to those elders. I give those thanks every single day. I want to share with you some of the teachings from some very lovely, wonderful mentors. Elder Vince Stogan, right from the Musqueam, right here on this unceded land, 
work with Elder Vince Stogan for many, many years. Elder Bob George from the Slaywood Tooth over on the North Shore. Many, many years those two I work with them. And their teachings as well as many other elders, but I want to honor Elder Vince today, his teachings. Whenever we come together, we must share a blessing and a prayer when we start our events. That blessing in the prayer covers our thoughts, covers our words, covers our interactions together. I'll share the teachings first and then uh, ask you to listen and then I'll ask you each to come out of your comfort zone to join and honour our, our Elder Vince's teachings. Elder Vince says that we must always be in a circle, but you know I work with another beautiful, beautiful elder, Elder Fred John from the Statlium, our Lilwalk people. He says, you know, when we couldn't do something in a ceremony in 2009, he says, you know what, somebody said, oh, we don't have this, we can't do the ceremony, Elder Fred, and Elder Fred says, hey, we're adaptable, we can modernize, we can make things happen. We did the ceremony. So we'll adapt under Elder Fred's teachings as I share Elder Vince's teachings. I want to share with you too that I work with Elder Vince's children, Elder Art and Elder Thelma Stogan. I didn't know them 40 years ago, but I know them well today. We're just like brother and sisters in our journey. I truly believe that Elder Vince and all of those other elders are guiding our steps today and taking care of the communities. Elder Vince's teachings are that whenever we come together, we would be in a circle. We would share the blessing and the prayer together. And Elder Vince says in that blessing and the prayer, what we do is we join hands. And when we join hands, what we do is we put our left palm upwards to our person on our left. That left palm up is to Father Sky. We put our right palm down to our person on our right. That right palm down is to Mother Earth. Elder Vince's other teachings are that our left palm up is to our ancestors. We're calling upon and calling down in the prayers to be amongst us as we work, play, interact. Our right palm down is to our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. When we join hands in that way, we're keeping those connections very, very strong. So before I call you each stand up, I want to share with you that when we say our prayers, it's not the Indigenous ancestors, it's each one of our ancestors that are in present in the event that we're calling upon. Many, many people always share with me, Elder Roberta, I felt so good after you did that prayer. And you know why you feel good? It's because your ancestors have come and they're present and they support you and they love you and they care for you. And that's why many, many people have that good feeling. So I'll call you each out of your comfort zone to join me in that teaching. So we'll stand up and come together if you're a little bit apart. And just stand in your rows, that's okay. And so we'll put our left palm up, join hands to your neighbor on your left. So our left palm is upwards, our right palm is downwards. Tell you, I was pretty confused when I met my elders. Sometimes didn't know my right from my left. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for honoring our, our dear elder, Vince Stogan. Haitka, Haitka Osiem, Osiem. We call upon you, Creator, to bring your many, many blessings down upon this very special event tonight. We call upon you, Creator, to bless the ones who are away due to illness or other obligations. Bless anyone yet to come. Help them to arrive safely, Creator. We call upon you, Creator, to bring your blessings down upon our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our spirits. So when we think our thoughts, they are good, positive, and respectful. When we speak our words, they are good, positive, and respectful. We call upon you, Creator, to bless the people who prepare the food, bless the food and drink we put in to nourish our bodies on our journeys to wellness and strength. And we call upon you, Creator, to bless all the shared teachings, all the shared learnings, all the shared interactions that will go on in our special event tonight. We kindly and respectfully ask you, Creator, to cover us each with your warm blanket of protection. Some of us, as we travel through our educational lives, 
our professional lives, our family lives, and our lives in general. We always give you many, many thanks, Creator, as we always ask you to bring all of your blessings down upon the hurting, the hungry, and the homeless, and especially the hurting, Creator. Haichka. Haichka Osiam. Osiam. Thank you, everyone. And just before you sit down, I want to share just another little teaching with each and every one of you. In the Coast Salish territory, in the Coast Salish longhouse, when we want to say thank you and honor, what we do is we put our hands up in the air, just like Elder Roberta. And I'll ask you to copy Elder Roberta, too. And we say, Haichka. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Someone comes and does an honorable, honorable deed. You want to really give them a warm thank you. We put our palms up in the air again. And we say, Haichka OCM. CM means matriarch, it means leader, it means someone who's done an honorable, honorable deed. So I really want to give you each a very special Haichka OCM, and you can have a seat now. You know, I don't want to distract you too much, but uh, on the weekend, my, some of my granddaughters and my sister and myself, um, we made these little uh, tiny orange uh, bows, and my sister added a special little touch to it. Uh, she put some hearts on it. Um, I want to pass this around because in the event, other events I was at today, people had to leave early and they didn't get a chance. So I want you guys to each get one. So we'll pass it around, and I think I have enough. Um, for everyone. So just take one out of the bag. I'm sorry I forgot the pins, but you can just carry it. Maybe use it as a bookmark. And the orange ribbons, I, um, my granddaughters and my sister and I helped to, to create, is to honor the orange shirt day that will happen. It's usually September 30th, but many schools and places are celebrating Friday the 28th and Monday the 1st. And that is to honor all of our children that were taken away from us and put in the residential school. So thank you for taking an orange ribbon and, and put it on yourself or use it as a bookmark or hang it on your wall or your computer. Uh, but you're more than welcome to uh, have, have one as I, as I uh, share with you this evening. So thank you everyone for honoring our Coast Salish uh, teachings and joining me in the blessing and the prayer. And thank you for coming to listen to me tonight. And I want to share with you that um, I mainly share from my heart and in the storytelling way and from my own lived experience. And um, when Paula contacted me and asked me to come and speak um, about our ways of knowing and of, around the importance of silence, I thought, ooh. But I do talk about it a lot with our people and with other people and all the things that I do about the importance of silence and, and what it brings and, and, that, and its respectful silence. And I want to share with you a little bit of my journey. Um, my mother, I found out when I met my mother in 1994, I found out that I had other siblings. My mother was the mother of 12 children. And I found out that uh, the Indian agent took eight of my mom's 12 children away from her and put her in Cooper Island Residential School. We were able to meet uh, all, most of our siblings. And for me and my sister's experience, um, we were actually grabbed on the way home from school when I was six, and my sister was eight, by two social workers before we could reach the reserved land, and we were taken away. And what happened to us in the foster home was the same thing that happened to my siblings in the residential school because we made the ribbons and the, I made some medicine pouches and brought a lot of like emotion and memories to me. So thank you for witnessing my tears. And I want to share with you in that journey of trying to take away our culture, 
trying to stop us from speaking our language, trying to stop us from acting in the ways that we were taught since time immemorial and up until I was six years old. And I think that unconditional love that I received, the wonderful nurturing really helped me survive all the years that I went through uh, some pretty horrific things. And um, I want to share with you the journey of meeting my mom. And as a good mom, a good auntie, and then a good grandma, I was always like very emotional with my children and my grandchildren and very, very affectionate. And when I first met my mom, I always had this dream because I look for her. I look for her for many, many years. And I always had this like fantasy in my mind that, you know, when I see my mom, it's kind of like that commercial where you bound through the field of flowers and then you jump into each other's arms and then you hug and everything's going to be happy ever after. And I did not realize how differently I was raised, forced to be raised. You know, it's that blunt ask, answer, yes, no, answer right now way and punished if you weren't. And so I met my mom. First of all, I thought that we could just be instantly mom-daughter. I met my mom and I tried to hug her, I tried to kiss her, and she was just like a rock. And I tried it many, many times. And then I got frustrated and I guess a little angry. What is wrong with my mother? Why doesn't she want to hug me or kiss me back? And I got mad. So I stayed away from my mom for a few months, I guess it was. And I always liked to figure things out. And I thought about it and the astonishment of what we all felt of meeting each other as brothers and sisters. We're, we're really not together today because we weren't raised together. And um, some of my siblings spent way all their entire life in the residential school and still don't really live well about it today, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and mentally. And um, in my frustration and anger, and you know, when you feel that way, it's all about you. Like, you know, what's wrong with the other person? I thought about it. And I thought, you know what? I, if I, I don't think I would be alive. If any one of my four children was forcibly removed from me, I can't imagine having 12 children taken from you. So I started to really think about it and really kind of understand my mom and the way she was, like being that solid rock. And that solid rock to, came to mean to me many other things in our journey together. My mom had diabetes and she had the effects of diabetes as she was getting up there in her age. So she started to call me to help me help her take her to the, the specialists. And that's how we got connected again. And then, oh, thank you, Paula. And then I thought about it, and I stopped trying so hard to hug my mom. I stopped trying to be affectionate with her. And very, very slowly, it didn't happen overnight, but very, very slowly over time, my mom reached for my hand. My mom reached up to give me a hug. My mom reached up to give me a kiss on my cheek or my forehead. And in the end, we became very close. At the time I met my mom, I was here at UBC in the NITEP program, the Native Indian Teacher Education program. 
in, in our courses, it said, you know, that we had to go out and find an elder to do an interview and do a paper on. I said, oh, perfect. I can, I can do this on my mom. So I asked her, and then I went over to her place. And this is where some of that teaching of the importance of silence came on for me. And that's the way I was raised. Like I said earlier, blunt, ask, answer, yes, no, answer the question. And I'm interviewing my mom away and not even thinking about how I'm saying the words about something that is very, very hurtful. And I said to my mom, Mom, did you get to hold any of your 12 children for long? My mom just sat there. She sat there in silence for a long, long time. And I want to share with you that wasn't just once my mom sat in silence before she would give me an answer. And here I am, you know, on the edge of my seat. Mom, mom, why aren't you speaking? Why, why don't you just answer my question? I got to get this paper done in my mind. Finally, she didn't answer me. And she said, no. I didn't get to hold and hug any one of you. And then we went on to a different portion of the, of, of the experiences. And... Um, my mom shared the story. My mom and my dad were all of their siblings and each of them were arranged marriages. And in, uh, you may know uh, that many, many of our societies are matriarchal. And as I go into the classrooms and I share what matriarchal means to our little ones, it means the grandmas and the great grandmas are the bosses. They follow all the directions of the grandmas and the great grandmas within the nations. And how I learned that, my mom's, um, my mom's and dad's marriage was arranged. But jumping back to learning about the matriarchs, uh, the great grandmas and the great grandpas, about 27 years ago, I was up in the Stalo Longhouse learning from the elders up there. We had many, many elders at that time. The speaker of the Longhouse, he, he was taught teaching us, and, and I, I think I still don't know how to keep quiet. <laughs> I'll still put up my hand and speak, and I'll still speak out. The speaker says, you know, in the Coast Salish territory, the men are the speakers. I just couldn't help myself. You know, I put up my hand and I stood up, you know, I had to be heard. And, and so I said, well, I guess I'm not a good Coast Salish woman because I'll always get up and speak. Nobody said a word. They all carried on at the teachings in the longhouse. And then we all went to feast with the elders. I sat with the women elders and the women, uh, one of the women elders, she's sitting beside me and she gently put her hand on my arm. And she said, Roberta, I heard what you said back there in the longhouse. And I went, oh dear, what is she going to say? Am I going to get a heck or something? And then she gently put her hand on my arm again and she said, Roberta, yes. The men were the speakers in Coast Salish territory because our longhouses were over one mile long. We needed their big voices to boom down those longhouses. And then she tapped my arm. And she said, Roberta, guess who told the men what to say? <laughs> so, but I still don't think I've learned of my lesson about blurting things out and answering and speaking up. And so I just wanted to share that little bit with you. So my mom shared that my dad and my mom were arranged marriages by my great grandma on my mom's side and my grandma on my dad's side. And 
And of course, and a part of this is a big teaching. When elders are speaking, elders and matriarchs are speaking, is not saying one word. I didn't learn that. I didn't know that. But my mom taught me. So then my mom talked about the arranged marriages, and it was the grandmas or the great grandmas that usually arranged this. But I had to interrupt her, and I said, but mom, mom, what if you didn't like the guy? Couldn't you just say no? And my mom sucked in her breath like I slapped her. And she sat there for a long time, not saying anything at all. And of course, I'm there. Come on, come on, come on, speak up. And when she finally spoke, she said, you never said no to any direction given to you by someone older than you, whether it's your brother, your sister, your auntie, your uncle, your grandma, your grandpa. You never said no. And she said, in fact, in our old Cowichan language, there is no word for no. So I learned my le little bit more of a lesson then in our journey. And I learned, and that wasn't just those only small examples that I gave you about what I learned about the importance of silence <coughs> and what I learned about respect. When it's, it's not just elders and matriarchs speaking. It is actually when anybody's speaking that we sit in silence and wait till they're finished. And we even sit and wait till it seems like a good time to say something that's so important. What I learned from my, my mom in those lessons on how to be respectful and what I learned from all those elders, those 30 elders that I worked with, they never filled all the time up with chatter, with talking. In my times of grieving and sorrow, which I had many years of, they would sit with me and just sit with me in silence. Let me cry, never saying anything. And I feel their teachings, my mother's teachings, really helped me. Like I shared, 1,975 families I've taken care of at BC Women and Children. to go in and respectfully be in their presence in their time of grief over the loss of their little one, little baby, little child, teenager. Very, very important that you don't ask questions, that you just sit there and you just wait for them to speak. And if they don't for a long time, that's okay, that you leave that time of silence, of respect, in order for them to have that, those healing moments. And despite the fact that I, you know, had terrible, terrible experiences um, in the foster home and later on, I, some of these things that come down to you through your generations could be from your grandma, your great grandma, your grandpa, your great grandpa, or even further back. It's in your genetic makeup. And some of the times when I was younger, and even in my early work uh, days, when someone would say something to me that was really, really rude or mean or nasty, I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't say anything back for a long time. And I 
what I was doing was thinking. How can I reply in a way that's not going to be the same as how I was just spoken to? I didn't really know that was in my genetic makeup into the journey of the work that I've done for the past nine years. And I was often called uh, slow, dumb, can't answer a question. And I just like let it be. I didn't realize that, you know, I was slowly building up that inner strength, that inner, uh, my spirit was beginning to stand a little bit. My spirit, I have to share with you, was flat for many, many years. It was those close to 30 elders that helped my strong spirit, helped me ground me in my identity, helped me ground me in who I am in my family, helped me ground me in what my family was in, my, in our history, and helped my spirit stand up strong. As I go into those circles in the classroom and I teach the little ones right from the preschool, right up into university as I've done for so many years, I ask those students, I ask the adults, and I ask each and every one of you tonight. I want each of you to look at Elder Roberta. Look at Elder Roberta. Do you think anybody pushes Elder Roberta around today? Let him try. I share that when you are grounded in your identity, when you are grounded in your family, when you are grounded in the history of your family, your spirit stands strong and you're able to do all the things that you do. So the silence I use almost on a daily basis because I do take care of many, many people both in the professional level and both in the levels of, the, of needing that support and that help around their emotional, spiritual balance. But I really feel, I think, that I have to hold my hands up to my mother um, for, the, for the very, very teaching that she did. Like she could have freaked out on me. She could have got up and left and walked out the room. But she didn't. She just sat there in that silence. And I used to get so upset with my mom too. We'd be somewhere at some event. And somebody would be very, very disrespectful to my mom. And I think she just became my rock of silence and support. And they would be openly rude to my mom or say things to her. And I would say, you know, when we were by herself, Mom, why do you let that happen? Why don't you say anything back when they do that to you? Why? No answer. No answer. And I want to share with you that journey of ceremony with my mother. Her journey, it took about four years for us to become very, very intimately sharing. And she shared her personal journey only with me out of all of her 12 children. The importance of ceremony, the importance of following direction. She said when she came to Snanemo, she didn't feel that welcome. Didn't feel it for whatever reason. When my mom came to my dad, she was less than half my dad's age. Maybe that was the reason. My dad had a first arranged marriage. They had four children, so I had four siblings from that marriage. But their spiritual beliefs did not align. They remained friends, and she went back to her family in Yakima, Washington. And that's how my dad kept his first four children out of the residential school, was he kept moving them back and forth, back and forth. Nobody could keep track of them. But my mom was not happy, she shared with me. My mom was very, very young, and my mom was really, really shy. She had lots to say, but she didn't speak. She would answer if you asked her things, but she was never like me. So I, I always say to people, uh, any bit of shyness you see in me comes from my mother. 
So my mother, she said she was unhappy and what you do and what we do today, she said, you know, what's gone, gone off the rail today is that when we don't like something, we walk away from it. We leave it, we quit it, we walk away from it. There's no ceremony left. And she said back then, she was sad, she was lonely. My great grandma took her everywhere. My great grandma showed her all the ways. My mom did the healing work with people, both spiritually and physically. I, I say to the doctors today, I'm glad my mom is kind of in heaven now because she delivered babies till she was 69 without a license. <laughs> my mom said, what you do is you don't walk away, you don't take off, you don't quit. She said what she did is when she was not, she was sad, what she did is when she saw her grandma, she said, Grandma, I want to come home. I want to come home to couch and I want to be with you. And as elders, matriarchs, and myself as elder, it just comes to you naturally. Someone asks you a question, you don't answer. You don't answer. Because you know they're not ready to hear the answer or they're not going to listen anyway. So you don't answer. My mom said my great-grandma didn't answer. My mom went on to have us four children with my dad, my oldest brother Kelly, my older sister who I live with and take care of, my younger sister, me, and then my younger sister. My mom never stopped asking her grandma. And she said to me, and when I, I was with my mom for those eight years, I only saw my mom cry three times. I cry at the drop of the hat. I cry over everything when I'm happy, sad, angry. I only saw my mom cry three times. This was one of them. She said, well, I never stopped asking your great grandma. Finally, when your baby sister was born, I asked her again. And your great grandma said, yes, yes, you can come home now. And my mom, she said, I was so incredibly happy. I was so, so happy. And at this time in our lives, they came around still on the reserves grabbing our children. They came and they grabbed my older brother Kelly when he was between three and four and they put him in Cooper Island Residential School. My mom said, I was so happy because I was able to pack up you three girls and go home to my grandma, just like I asked. And then she said, I was so happy, I was packing you all up and your grandma on your dad's side walked in. She came right up to me. Your grandma on your dad's side said, it's okay, it's okay. You can go home, you can go home, but the kids stay here. Through her tears, my mom said to me, but I couldn't say to your grandma, but I changed my mind. I changed my mind. I want my girls. I want my girls. Through her tears, she said, I had to pack my bags and go home myself because that's what I asked for. That's part of what I realized. Ceremony. Ceremony was entrenched in my mother. And my mother was entrenched in ceremony. She truly followed that when she told me, when you are given a direction by someone older than you, you follow it, you don't question it, you don't argue, you follow it.
and she did. I didn't see my mother. I was two. My sister was just born. My sister was four. My brother was six in the residential school. I didn't see my mother for 36 years. But I really truly believe too that ceremony helped bring us back together. And I got to spend eight years with my mother. So I want to thank you, each and every one of you, for listening to how some of us elders come to be elders. And I want to share with you, as taught to me by my elders, that not all elders are old people. And not all old people are elders. As my elders have taught me, sometimes it is shown when you're little, little, what you're going to be. Sometimes the elders, when they see that, they guide you. And like I shared with you, those 30 elders, they knew who I was. If you'd have told me 10 or 11 years ago that I would be going into the hospitals, I would have said, you're crazy. I can't do that. I can't do that. I feel the elders and the ancestors and the Creator have chosen the path that I'm on for me. And that's why I go willingly. That's why I'm at three or four events per day, because I really feel it's important to lift our people up, to, to encourage our people in a really good way, to role model it. To role model it. Not tell, to role model it. So I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for uh, and share the story about why I said that shyness about my mother. My mother shared, I was the only child that she shared with about her experience at Cooper Island Residential School. When I first met my mother, my sister and I moved, she moved to Richmond in 1980 and I followed her very shortly after and we always loved Steve Stin. And it wasn't until I started to research my history of why we are, like this traditional chief I know in the interior, he would always say, we are so connected to the land. It's like the blood that runs through our veins. And I kept saying, Mike, why do you always say that? Until it finally dawned on me. My sister and I love Steveston. Do you guys know Steveston in Richmond? We love Steveston. We always went there. When we first met our mom, we said, Mom, you got to come to this place. We'll bring you to our shops. We'll bring you for fish and chips to our favorite restaurant. And I think all my mom heard was fish and chips because she loved fish. She ate fish all the time. So we brought my mom to Steveston. We didn't know her, and she was quite up there in her age. We're walking down the main street of Moncton, and our mom, out of the blue, just starts chuckling away to herself. And my sister and I are really nervous. We look at each other and think, Mom, Mom, why are you laughing? Nobody said anything. But of course, I can't help myself. We get in the restaurant, we order our tea and our food. And I say to my mom, Mom, why were you laughing back there on the street? And she told us a story. The last time I was here, it was mud and boards. From the time my mom was three till the time she was 11, she came to Steveston with my great auntie and uncle who worked in those 16 canneries that were in operation at the height of the fishing industry. They brought my mom to keep her away from the residential school. And she would sit on the boat and couch in territory, you start knitting when you're two. My mom knit those sweaters, slippers for well over 70 years. You start knitting, so she would knit. She said, you start with the little slipper. When my great auntie would get behind, she'd come and get my mom to tell her, push the cans ahead, because if you're not fast, you get fired just like that. And my mom would go in, because she's little, to go under and push the cans ahead. And the reason why she was laughing is because my great auntie and uncle, she didn't get fired that day. So they bring my mom up to the only store there, the Japanese store, and buy my mom an ice cream cone. And when you're three, that's a big treat. Like my granddaughter who's sleeping in the car. Um, 
Then when my mom was 11, the Indian agent caught my mom. He put her in the Cooper Island Residential School. My mom did not speak English. She didn't speak English. She said the nuns were beating her with what was equivalent to a two by four. They didn't break just one of my mom's legs, but they broke both of her legs. And you know, many, many of my relatives are out back in Cooper Island. I say for Cooper Island, it was just too bad for Cooper Island because my mom didn't die. They had to do something with my mom. They took her off the island. They put her in the hospital. And she said, my great grandma went into that hospital and got my mother. My mother said the police couldn't even get my mom away from my great grandma. So I say, any of the shyness you see in Elder Roberta comes from my mother. Any of the power that you see in Elder Roberta comes from my great grandmother. I want to thank you again for, for listening. And Paula.